Welcome to the ZBrush Podcast. This episode was recorded at the ZBrush Summit in 2017 with a very special guest, the founder and creative director of the special effects company Weta Workshop, Sir Richard Taylor. We were so excited to have Sir Richard Taylor as our guest, where he accepted the honorary ZBrush Central Award. If you missed the live presentation of this, it's all available on our YouTube channel. You can check that out in the Pixelogic Events ZBrush 2017 playlist. And also, we just want to send a quick reminder to all of you listeners, if you're listening on Apple iTunes podcast or on the podcast app, please give us a review in the review section. We'd greatly appreciate your feedback, as well as liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, where we've got tons of video content, as well as all of our podcasts are hosted there. And any feedback in our comment section in our podcast videos or any other videos, we greatly appreciate. So without any further delay, this is the ZBrush podcast with Sir Richard Taylor. This just this sense of love and appreciation for sculpture that seems to be a primary driving force in all of your creative projects. You know, you're at Weta Workshops now, Weta Digital. You know, formerly the big, obviously the big projects that you've talked tons about, which is Lord of the Rings and all of these awards that you've won for these these pictures, including King Kong, um, other pictures like District Nine, which you know it seems like you you're one of those creative types that you really come from humble beginnings and you're true to the art form. As you mentioned, you're, you're building this sculpture park. These are things that you're still doing in your free time. It's amazing. How do you manage to keep up with all these things? What keeps you going? I, I might have a pathological issue that every <laughs> time a moment opens up that I should really rest, I cram some other creative aspiration into it. But You know, like I think everyone that's working in the creative industries, uh, some people live to create and then some of us uh, create to live. And uh, if it wasn't in my life, I I think I'd be a greatly lesser individual. So I I find that I have to generate uh, projects that keep me creatively inspired and consume creativity at a at a very fast pace where right. I go trying to photograph public art sculpture celebrating uh, in uh, the work of others etc so it's just a great way to absorb do you find that you get an itch when you when you do not I mean I imagine you keep enough projects and things open you know in kind of in flux do you ever get an itch if you stop if you don't if you're not working on something yeah, do you take yeah. breaks yeah yes um you know, my wife and I hadn't really had a holiday for a long time. Uh, and then we went to Fiji for four days with our two children. Uh, and that was the longest break we'd had maybe for 25 years. And I, uh, by the third day, I was literally... <laughs> you're itchy. You're like, okay, yeah, this is great, the, bud. <laughs> by the fourth day, that was it. I was back on this doing sketches of ideas and... Uh, sitting in the chalet while the kids were on the beach. So. I, I find that with this podcast, talking to so many creative types, that's always a consistent sort of underlying part of, our, of us being creative types is that we're always, that it's a lifestyle. It's not a, it's not a career. It's not a, a, you know, working in production is just a part of that. People that make that their career, but it's about living that lifestyle. Yeah, I think almost everyone that works for us would be doing it as a significant hobby if they hadn't been able to turn it into a career. Yeah. And so it is a lifestyle. It is all that they want to do. It's, uh, it, it fills their every waking hour. Most of our team have their own projects on the go, so they complete a 10-hour day with us and then on arriving home start something else in exactly the same discipline. And I, I think that's fabulous. It, it shows is. that it's running through the veins of their body. Well, I mean, you look around these kinds of films and stories that you're telling. I mean, some of them are actually sitting in these magazines, not intentionally, but I would imagine that that's a key factor that you, a part that you look for with your team. What, you could, what a digital and what a workshops, there's a true passion that you see with. I'm a huge fan of what a workshops, I believe, puts out. Uh, Dr. Gorbort comic books, mm-hmm. those 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 stories, which I love oh, that. And these right. are they're not the most, you know, obviously your your greatest achievements are what get talked about the most, as deservedly so. 
But I love these 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 projects that I see. I go to Weta Digital and Weta workshops all the time. Just check out the websites and see what's being done. Bronze sculptures being made and. It's it's fantastic. You guys are kind of in every realm of the creative fields. Yeah, and we're, we're best known for our feature film work, but I never think about us as a company servicing the film industry. We're a company servicing the world's creative industries. And then, of course, we are also generating our own creative through uh, Dr. Grawlboard's been a good example. My, my wife and I set up a little... It's not really a business, it's an endeavour at the beginning of our careers. And this was a very modest thing initially. Uh, and we put some money away every week. Uh, it started off as $2 a week and that grew over the years. And what we do with that money is that we, uh, under this banner of this thing we call Stardog, we fund uh, individuals within our workshop that have an aspiration to create their own uh, creative endeavour, uh, whether that be in sculpture, in IP, uh, primarily sculpture. And that that fund has allowed a number of people to develop their own creative worlds, launch their careers in fine art. Uh, primarily Max Pate uh, worked with us for 10 years as a sculptor, running our sculpting department. But uh, we were able to support him and uh, he has gone on to extraordinary heights. He, he is a well-recognised, world-recognised uh, fine art sculptor now, very successful uh, gallery sales. Uh, Greg Broadmore in the world of Dr. Grawbots came out of Stardog. My Johnny favorite. Fraser Allen's Gloaming came out of Stardog. So this has been a really great way to try and engender in people the confidence that they can create a line of sculpture. It's, you know, if you're just doing ones and twos, it's very hard to establish your name. But if you can do a gallery of art, then you've got the chance of proving that you've got an established um, art style and uh, collection that you can put out on the world stage. Right. I, I, I wondered, it, as far as the... Because it, it seems like you have a true passion for the practical sense, the really getting in there, sculpting in clay. I mean, we're, we're surrounded by all these, some of this stuff is student work. Yeah, and, the, and they, I've never seen them before until I arrived today, and there's some mind-boggling work it here. Is. Yeah. It's, it's, it is. I imagine at, with Weta, Weta, Weta workshops especially that you have, I mean, I've seen videos online of just the setting, the environment, and something that Noman does as well is, every table is handcrafted. It's all built to the specifications of the founders and their vision. And it it creates this sense of inspiration. It, you walk in and if this is your job, you walk in and you're, you're ready, you're fired up. It's not, it doesn't feel like work. No, we, feels... we specifically from a very early start, we, we're in an old factory or, or it, it actually started off as a, as a psychiatric hospital at the turn of the century, but over the years it eventually ended up as a manufacturing facility for pharmaceuticals laid in ruin for 10 years and we moved in and uh, probably very much like this building, just fitted out for our needs. And uh, from a very early beginning, we started hanging our work on the walls. And, and over the years, it's really become a mini museum to what we do. That's amazing. But it, it has a benefit because, of course, when our team walks through the building or new recruits come into the building, they are inspired by the work around them. And you only have to look on the walls and you can see the historical work of our career and know that you're in a place that celebrates and loves the the process of creativity. And I, yeah. I think that's a very important part of it. Absolutely. That's amazing. I mean, it's I think it's important to always remember you, the humble beginnings and be able to see the progression of things and always remember that it, although starting small, look what you can achieve and get to this point where you can tell all of these stories or build and make all of these things that once were maybe a few of you, you know, starting with yeah. you and your wife and, and the small people that you were bringing on. So that's, it's fantastic. It, it's, it's a true inspiration for us. I mean, you're here at the ZBrush Summit. You're accepting the honorary ZBrush Award, which, you know, we kind of just ushered you through the crowd of all these youngins and all these young 3D artists. And most of them are sculptors. They're, they want to be character artists. They want to work in all kinds of fields. But there's a true sense of community, I guess. And this is your first time being at the summit. Yeah, it is. I feel very privileged to be invited. Uh, I actually didn't, I wasn't aware of the summit. Oh, well, um, I, yeah, well, I live in a bit of a, well, you are <laughs> a, a very a small little bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, you asked, you were commenting before about the passion. To me, uh, I don't hire for talent. People would naturally feel that we would look through portfolios and look for the best artists. But we hire in order of importance, as I've said before, for passion, enthusiasm, tenacity, and then talent. And quite often we'll hire off a very um, uh, uh, enthusiastic letter and an interview more than we'll hire for portfolio wow. material. Because, that's interesting. Well, because it's critical to us that we're on a journey together uh, as a team, uh, equally impassioned by the project. When you're running as fast and as hot as we have to to meet our deadlines, it's critical that you have an individual next to you that is impassioned by what they're doing. They're driven by their enthusiasm and they're incredibly tenacious. You can't have someone flaking in the 11th month, for instance. Right. You know, you've got to have this stickability. And in the environment of heightened creativity that uh, I hope we've created in the workshop, an individual that has budding talent will see it flourish because they're around like-minded individuals. I'd much rather have that than someone that's immensely talented but lacking tenacity, yes. enthusiasm, and passion. So I call it, uh, it it's the Beatrix Potter um, uh, yeah. factor. I'm looking for people that are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, you know, <laughs> that, that are willing to that. come to work every morning. We, you know, you don't want to drag someone kicking and screaming sure. through their cynical day. You, you need someone that's impassioned by what we're doing. We're too privileged, uh, all of us, the people out here, the people that are living that are working in this industry, we're just too privileged to have been given uh, this opportunity to work in the creative industries to be cynical about it. So I think that's such a great point. That was actually something I talked about with the last artist, Brett Briley. The, the, the respect to the fact that we are very fortunate to be in this very it's a, it can be a small it's a small creative bubble as far as the people that are applying themselves in these parts the, the, uh, as far as the creation of these assets the creations of just all kinds of things whether it's film in in you guys are involved in all kinds of other projects including statues but that's kind of the it's it's i always kind of compare it to cross country versus sprinting you you can have that i guess the the ability to quickly come up with something that looks fantastic and amazing but I imagine these kinds of projects, especially at Weta Workshops, are their long, intense projects that require patience and the dedication to stick around and stick through it and stay positive and appreciate it. I use exactly the same metaphor. Ah. I say that we're running a marathon, never a sprint. Yeah. You know, that we're on film projects often and they have a destination, they have a conclusion, but... Uh, for us, the film projects blend between each other because you don't finish a film project, start another one. You, you, I, I use this, that's the teeth on the cog right. of the machine and they intermesh. And so the, I, I went to the screening of uh, Blade Runner the other night oh. with our staff because we did a miniature did shoot for it. Oh, I thought it was it was near perfect movie. I, I was staggered by That's it. That's so exciting to hear. But, We've been so busy around here, we haven't had a chance yeah, to see it. No, but I'm sure. Sunday night, it's but, coming. But you know that 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 is a an incredible moment in a series of moments. And for us, the our team have to be on the marathon through their 25, 30 year career, not visualizing these short sprints to the deadline of each of these movies because the next client is deserving of the same intent that you put on on that job uh, before you on the job after. So it's very important that we keep that momentum. Right. I can absolutely see the importance of that. And it, it's in, hopefully that this will be inspiration for those out there that are you know, that, that deal with this. The, the digital industry, I mean, as you know, you, you, you mentioned you use ZBrush. I am not sitting every day doing it, but the argument was made, no, but you are one of the very first people that embraced it and art directed on a near daily basis. And yeah. I've built ZBrush so significantly into the pipeline of a, a, a very large part of what we do at Weta. We, we had the great blessing of uh, having two early practitioners join us, uh, Maddie Spencer and yeah. Andrew Baker. And, uh, they they both brought the inspiration of this software. We were still using haptic arms, sculpting and haptic technology. 
my very good friend Carl Meyer at Gentle Giant. Uh, he was inspirational in, uh, in, in, in sort of kicking me up the backside yeah. and getting me into thinking about ZBrush because he had already, through Maddie Spencer, started to utilize it and through other uh, colleagues that were working alongside him. And uh, it just took hold so fast. We'd already been 3D printing for many, many years. We've mm -hmm. got a very large suite of 3D printers, milling machines, other digital technology. And the fluidity by which we suddenly discovered that we could create extraordinary pieces of sculptural art uh, through this uh, incredible software uh, was sort of revolutionary to us. And, uh, you know, a, a very large part of our pipelines now are perfectly combinations of hand skill model making uh, and craftsmanship and ZBrush technology. Yeah, and for those people that don't know, you you basically, you highlighted all of those major parts. And for us, from the ZBrush perspective, we, a few years ago, we were nominated for an, an Academy Award for an Oscar for Technical Achievement, which so much of what Weta did in that era of what you're describing is, you know, that was at the stage where ZBrush were still it was early in its in its infancy, it really, was, yeah. and it was it was still you know it's it's very tough in the professional world to transition from old techniques to new techniques, and and we're all kind of we all craft our abilities based around the tools that we have, and at that era, you guys adopting ZBrush became a very prominent thing, yeah. and, and it allowed ZBrush to be seen in all other aspects to truly consider it, and we're beyond thankful for that and and you know looking back on that th those are very humble beginnings for us as well and and which is why you accepting this award regardless if you use zbrush you are a, a true um you know follower of sculpture in that style of art that type of art so you know for yeah, the, us the, the moment i saw it i i just knew that it had to be more than an illustration tool that it, it had to be more than or, or a concept design tool. Mm -hmm. And Andrew specifically was using it so beautifully to conceptualize characters for films that we were designing, uh, most significantly Schmaug, uh, uh, the goblins from The Hobbit, and many other characters. But it, it was so immediately evident that it needed to flow seamlessly into our 3D pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an incredible individual that works for us called uh, Jordan and... Uh, he has uh, almost, um, almost entirely through his own endeavor, built a huge amount of our 3D robotic manufacturing equipment. Wow. And uh, he, um, it, it became so evident that we needed to find ways to drive that equipment other than through the more protracted softwares at an engineering level. Uh, because that's how we were uh, driving this equipment to that point. We needed something that was much more fluid, much more sculptural. And the results that we're able to now get off a seven-axis milling machine mm -hmm. and ZBrush is is just extraordinary. And uh, you know, as I was saying, I, I'm building a, uh, a sculpture park, and a number of the sculptures in that park are generated through ZBrush into this technology at monumental scale. Wow. And uh, that, that's a really great extension of a piece of software that primarily had been developed for doing, you know, small, cons very considered pieces of concept art. Right, right. For you guys, as far as your, because you're doing a lot of, I'm curious as, as far as what you're doing at Weta Workshops now, because you're coming off of these long-winded projects. You've got seven years with Lord of the Rings and then The Hobbit uh, is sprinkling in with all of these other things. And you mentioned that at Weta Workshops, particularly you guys are maybe using ZBrush and milling tools to build props or assets for reference or those things. The digital assets are being created at Weta Digital. But for you guys, what now that you've you've moved past all these projects, I imagine that you know, like all artists, we all have to kind of find that next spark or that next project. So I wonder what it is that you guys are doing now. Is there anything particular that you've yeah. been working on? No, no, exactly. Uh, you know, we still love working on movies and yeah. we're doing a number Which, yeah, that's uh, still this going. year. But uh, you want to find something new, yeah. uh, something that works under a different uh, paradigm, I guess, uh, something that isn't driven by the things that drive filmmaking. Uh, and 
the big thing that we're getting more and more into is what's called what we call location-based entertainment, uh, but really exhibition work, themed experience, and so on. We've done stuff like this for many, many years, and I've held exhibitions specifically around Dr. Grawbort's and the gloaming through the Star Dog endeavour I was mentioning uh, in various countries across the world. In fact, I've just brought a major exhibition back from Wuxian in, in China. In fact, one of the chaps I just met outside, one of the ZBrush artists uh, I met in, in wow. that city. He's here now. Yeah, and so that was really nice. That's amazing. And, um, <laughs> We're now running a design competition there as well, which is something that uh, we've been running in Korea for a number of years, where uh, in collaboration with the mayor of Gwangmyong, we, uh, we uh, run a design competition for Korean and New Zealand students uh, around concept art and sculpture. And the winners get to come and intern with us in our workshop. And in fact, I've got the first two Chinese students with me right now. Wow. Uh, but that exhibition was a massive exhibition of Dr. Grawbort's. That stuff is incredibly inspiring. Uh, the most uh, fulfilling thing I've done in my career now, um, and to some degree has even topped the uh, the extraordinary experience and opportunity to do Lord of the Rings, is a exhibition about New Zealand's most uh, sort of important military campaign uh, around the war of Gallipoli in the First World War. And we were asked to develop and build in collaboration with our National Museum, a uh, exhibition to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of wow, that. what an incredible and, project. Yeah, and uh, it was. And uh, I decided, I, I came up with this concept to, uh, called Gallipoli, the scale of our war. And ultimately we built uh, eight figures, 2.4 times life size, hyper realism, wow. utilizing every technology we've got ex at, at our access in the workshop ZBrush considerably, uh, all physical hand sculpting of the final hyper-realistic silicon replicas. That's incredible. So um, where does this rest today? Where, where? It's in an exhibition in Wellington. Okay. It's been there for three years. It's had 1.5 million people through it, which is a third of the population of our country. Yeah. So uh, you imagine an exhibition in America that has a third of the population well, go through it. What a true so, honor. Uh, I mean, you, it, see, it appears to me that New Zealanders, you know, Kiwis. As they well, that's like, driven by patriotism. That's driven there's by... There's a true patriotism yeah, and love for the country. A huge and unbelievable and important respect for returned servicemen. Uh, we still have uh, a uh, every Anzac... Uh, anniversary, a huge part of the country's population celebrates and comm commemorates the men that served and were lost in the war. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's a good place for a country to be, that it re recognises it's fallen. Absolutely. And, uh, and will fund exhibitions as significant as this. And then have a population of this scale of 1.5 million people that will go and visit it in commemoration to that battle. That's incredible. And Wellington, I mean, this is this is where you're born and raised from. You grew I up wasn't in Wellington. born there, but okay. I've spent over half my life there. My wife and I moved there when we were 17 and uh, have been there ever since. Can't imagine living anywhere else. I was going to say, that was going to be my next question. It seems that, do you think you'll ever leave? Because, you know, I, I could I could see the association with keeping Weta and obviously for shooting locations, New Zealand worked very well for the vast amount of films that were done there. But now, as you guys continue to grow, I'm sure there will be more added to that franchise. I'm not going to pry for those questions, but I imagine that you seem to have that great pride as well. And that will be your, your yeah, I'm, base I'm, for, forever. Yeah, I'm passionate about Wellington. I'm a very passionate New Zealander. Uh, yeah. I, I immigrated to New Zealand when I was four years old from Northern England and, uh, Ever since the day I arrived, I realized that we were blessed as a family to have ended up in this extraordinary country. And the moment that we arrived in Wellington, I, I, tr I appreciated uh, that this would become our home. And, uh, you know, my wife and I have been there for over 30 years now. And we, uh, we've made Wellington our home. But more importantly, Wellington invites you to, uh, to, to live in its amazing city. They, 
the, the way I say, uh, cities were built to service people, right? Mm -hmm. And most cities in the world don't service people anymore. The people That's have so to true. work to service the city. Yeah. Wellington, thankfully, is still of a size. It's only 350,000 people, so probably smaller than the district we're sitting wow. in. And uh, it, it, it's, it still services the people that live there. And for us, uh, when we're bringing, uh, especially where to digital, a lot of people in from around the world, in some ways it's irrelevant whether they are uh, the person working with you enjoys the city because they're working, yeah. but their spouse and their siblings uh, sorry, and their children, mm -hmm. uh, that is critical. Uh, their families have to enjoy the city because they're not working in the job. They're out right. and about. They've got, to, they've got to know that they're going to find the right sports clubs, the sure. right recreational activities, the right religious groups, mm -hmm. uh, the right level of society. And, you know, here I am, see? You what can tell you I'm passionate about, yeah, about no, Wellington. <laughs> right. So what, what, get me off the subject quick. <laughs> Okay, Back yeah. onto ZBrush. I'll I'll dive right. I'll I'll pivot. The so for you, you know, this all of these these new projects you're working on. This I, I wanted to ask you about this the these the sculptural theme park as you put it. I'm very curious no, no, about sculpture this sculpture park. Sculpture it's not park. A theme park. I keep wanting to say theme park no, because no. to me, I keep thinking no, I, you're elevating it way above what it is. There's it's a, a film that I'm picturing. It was called Oh gosh, I can't remember. It was about a girl who's. She's trained to be an assassin, but it was beautifully shot. And they had these old, I believe it, it was somewhere in Eastern Europe, but these old sort of theme parks with all these sort of statues and things that had been, you know, decaying, decaying away. away. Yeah. And I just, that's what I keep envisioning. So I'm sorry. So explain to me what this is. That I know it's in. actually just a sculpt. It's a small endeavor of my, of my wife and mine. And uh, we've been working on it for about three and a half years. And, uh, it's really driven by two things. Uh, the first being that uh, New Zealand doesn't have a great deal of, of sculpture in the streets because we're a young city. We celebrate our indigenous culture mm -hmm. at an incredible level, a level we can be very proud of. Uh, and we also have a lot of uh, contemporary abstract art in our society. But figurative and fancy art sculpture is not a thing that you see in the public. Right. Uh, as you may see in streets around the world, you know, you go to uh, the city of Seoul and the streets are filled with amazing sculpture. So I wanted to uh, build somewhere that could house sculpture that we've made in the workshop uh, at a monumental scale uh, and a place that I could invite uh, young people to come and experience this level of creativity and fantastical art. Mm -hmm. And then also my wife and I are patrons of the Neonatal Trust of New Zealand and uh, a big challenge for families with a neonatal baby is uh, how to get their kids out of the hospital system where they're often having to stay and taking them somewhere inspiring. So it's sort of driven by those things. It also gives me a personal uh, opportunity sure. in the weekend <laughs> when I can get some time uh, to do something I love doing, which yeah. is combining uh, landscaping, uh, sculpture, miniature railway. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're sculpting in how much of what, what kind of materials are we well, talking about? Well, uh, interestingly, a lot of the sculptures are done through uh, either direct sculpting or uh, ZBrush sculpting. And then in some cases, we've printed them on 3D printers, turned them into bronze. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's an expense that I can only really afford. So I've only sure. got a very small number of bronzes. Uh, and in fact, probably the coolest piece I've got is, uh, well, there's two beautiful pieces. One is uh, a piece directly sculpted in ZBrush by Andrew Baker, mm -hmm. which um, uh, which I've had blown up and then turned into a bronze. And uh, the great sculptor David Meng uh, did this extraordinary um, uh, dragon to celebrate my... I've got two children and on, on each of their births, I've had a sculpture done to commemorate their births. And for my son, I had this... Uh, Tri Triceratops Centaur done by Jamie Bess Warwick. Oh, I'm jealous. Already. And uh, <laughs> for my daughter, uh, I, I asked David Meng if he would do this dragon sculpture. I just said, dragon and whip it. Those small <laughs> greyhounds. <laughs> I wanted a, a, a whip it light dragon. 
And of course, being David, he did this mind-boggling sculpture, which I scanned and turned that into a seven-foot-tall bronze. But wow. most of the sculptures are actually uh, milled in the negative with one of our milling machines into polystyrene. And then two of our staff members uh, quit work to invent a product, and it's called Pal Tire. And uh, mm. I'm the largest user of it in the world at the moment, <laughs> but I hope that uh, more people use it. And it's a concrete-based material uh, that sets exactly like concrete, but can be sculpted exactly like clay. Wow. And uh, we've done... Is there a time between it, setting yeah, yeah, that you Yeah, yeah, it's exactly to... the same as concrete. For I see. 40 minutes is the working time. So you mix small batches in a in a bread dough mixer. Mm -hmm. and uh, But you can get extraordinary fine detail in it. We're doing an int at the moment oh, that's uh, for the sculpture part, doing it at work in front of the public. And um, uh, that's getting sculpted down to fine bark detail. But anyway, in the case of these sculptures where I'm not, where it's not done in direct sculpting, we actually just apply it into the inside of the poly mold uh, and uh, let it set and then break the polystyrene away. And for me, it's the most cost-effective way I can do very large sculpture. Uh, and it's very, very impacting, very in inexpensive and successful. And it seems like you can, ma you can manage this with a relatively small team. Well, with one person. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one person can really do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So. That's well. How, what are your feelings on? You know, as we're winding down, I don't want to take too much of your time, but the that aspect of you know you can manage these things with a with a few people and a very you know dr driven team and passionate team. But you know now, if you, here at the summit, you'll you'll see how many of these, so many of these followers of sculpture and this this community of people all working in digital. A lot of them not getting and not growing up in an era where sculpting in clay, th these foundational tools are now being taught in digital. Well, that, that's been the greatest joy of coming here is to see the physical sculpting studio because mm -hmm. all but a very small number of our sculptors have come through a traditional sculpting background. And I, I strongly suggest to anyone that's ZBrush sculpting, grab a chunk of plasticine and have it by your desk, mm -hmm. have it next to the Wacom tablet, and if nothing else, just squish it between your fingers. Mm, that's uh, good you know, just, just the sensory uh, tactility of actually moving organic materials, and think about how that now relates to you pushing pixels around on the screen. Mm -hmm. I, as I'll mention tonight in, my, in the talk that I'm giving, I, I, I like to think that um, art and craftsmanship is the soul of a country. Uh, it, it's the it's the object, the art that has existed through the centuries that that becomes the pennant that calls our country's people to celebrate in their particular culture. Mm. Uh, you could argue, well, surely religion does that, but religion is focused on a single uh, or, or on a specific sector of uh, celebration. You could argue that surely politics does it or sports does it. I would. I would counter argue that it's actually art and craftsmanship, the very things around us mm -hmm. that have uh, tactility, beauty, uh, physicality that, uh, that registers the, uh, the journey of humanity through their creative uh, I so much appreciate place. that. And I, that's a wonderful way of putting it because all the things you're saying are true. But if, if that's looking, I think in nowadays we like to dissect things and focus on d too much of the details sometimes. But the broader picture of things is that is what drives most of us without these small creative passions and creativity does not mean drawing or sculpting and like we've kind of like to define things art for example but art can be many things you know it, it's zbrush as a whole coding programming can be an art form it's a, it's just it's i think it boils down to that passion and that that need or desire to build things is very consistent. It, with it is. It, it, we we did it with these for mm -hmm. me, for many centuries, and now we can do it with a yeah. a Wacom tablet and a uh, and the cursor mm -hmm. uh, uh, or the stylus. The but they're still equally as important. What people are doing today in ZBrush and other softwares 
is still creativity at the forefront of their lives. Absolutely. The beauty with the reducing costs and and upscaling of 3D printers is it means that it's becoming very easy for a ZBrush sculptor to be able to turn their beautiful artwork into physical objects. Absolutely. And the one thing I beg of anyone that's listening that isn't thinking about this, although most people are, is push print. To yes. the limit of your budget, when you finish something, even if you're questioning whether it's got worthiness to print, still push Just print. Just do it. And get it on the shelf because yeah. you start to fill the world with more beautiful objects. Mm -hmm. And the moment it comes out of the machine and is sitting on your desk mm -hmm. and others can interface with it and celebrate in it, and even if it's just a passing glance and seeing the object, as I can see these incredible yeah. things around the room here, it shifts your perception of the world. It's It makes you see the world as a world filled with beauty and intriguing objects. Some would argue that the two characters here are far from beautiful. They're beautiful in technique, but they're fascinating in subject. So mm -hmm. it causes you to do one thing above all else, and that's ask a question. What's that about? Mm, you know, that's and, very and, true. And isn't that great if we can get people, especially young children, to start asking, yeah, but what's that about? Yeah. Because then they start to dream, they start to think, they're yeah. outside of and the And isn't screen. that such the, the sort of the root of learning is questioning things and forcing us to investigate further into things. And like you mentioned with two two dimensional images looking through a screen, especially there is something about just touch and being able to see and being in that environment that you cannot replicate in, in an image. And it, for me, the first, the first time I ever took a sculpture that I made, which was ZBrush and I printed it, having it, it, it changed my whole perspective. Yeah. On, it just, it reinforced the love that I had I would argue that one of the critical um, uh, sort of requirements of all artists is to create one thing in the world above almost anything else, and that is awe, to create the sense of awe in mm -hmm. people so that when uh, a young person, young or old person, sees a piece of art, they have a sense of awe. And the moment that something is in the three-dimensional, it has a much greater and heightened ability to give the sense of awe because it's now in your physical space. And uh, to me, that's a very exciting place that the uh, that 3D printing is taking us. I, I, one of my great loves is architectural sculpture, New York probably being the greatest mm -hmm. example of it in, in the world. And obviously, since the Industrial Revolution, or at least since... Um, let's say the Bauhaus movement, post-war industrialized uh, construction, the reduction of uh, uh, low-cost craft-based labor, these sorts of ornamentations have left architecture. Mm -hmm. we, we went through that phase of massive concrete uh, monoliths and then into uh, what we get today. But the thought that in the very near future, due to low-cost 3D printing and sustainable materials that can cope with UV, wind loading, etc., we might start to see the re-emergence of highly ornate, mm -hmm. beautifully crafted uh, physical architecture in our streets. And uh, that alone would be an amazingly inspiring thing Absolutely. to see. Absolutely. I appreciate that sentiment so much. I hope that within my lifetime that we'll be able to see that because there is, there has become this sort of mechanically driven, you know, the business and the pursuit of growth and expansion. I think often just as humans, we forget to stop and take a look. You know, we love to look back on history and we love to see these things for what they were and respect them. But in the present day, it's very hard to, to take yourself out and view it in that way and realize that, you know, it, it is very industrial, especially in America. You know, it's, it's why we sort of love to romanticize the idea of going back to Europe or going to these old towns and, and traveling to see these things. But, you know, fortunately my roommate, he works in engineering. He, they worked on a skyscraper downtown. I think it's Korean air and it's actually a beautifully shaped building. They actually made it in the shape of a wing, but it has this, very subtle craftsmanship that stands out amongst all these other buildings that are just very angular. And all, the, and all this architecture has a place in history, of course, and it's an evolution of the time mm -hmm. it lived in. But 
uh, and and ornate baroque whatever mm-hmm. crafted uh, architecture isn't for everyone and yeah. uh, I'm sure that we're not going to see cities filled with it but wouldn't it be lovely to see individual examples emerge where you see the ZBrush artists of today you imagine if one of these great ZBrush artists that is lecturing here uh, collaborated with one of the great architectural firms of America oh. and built a skyscraper I for the hope, city of LA. I, oh, I hope that that's the thing. And you actually just answered a question that I've been asking many people on this is, what do you envision? Because I see the, especially these digital artists, these, these young people that are growing up it, it, with these digital tools and coming up with these amazing things, but it's all focused in, in generally speaking, the only careers are entertainment and majority. But I see that there's a lot of, I don't think that these, these types of artists get enough respect for the amount of things that we have to study, anatomy, silhouette, color theory, all these things to make all this stuff happen. And I see it expanding into a much bigger universe of, of application. And that would be a wonderful way for uh, no doubt. And to, to what you're saying, if if I'm asked by a young person trying to get into the industry, but what do I need to learn? Uh, what do I need to pursue to uh, sharpen my skills? And what I say to them uh, with absolute integrity of, of comment is, uh, first and foremost, you have to learn to observe. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would argue that maybe 95% of the world's population today look at the world. They look at it so they don't bump their head, trip over a rock, hit a car, they can find their home, they can navigate their way through it. Mm -hmm. What distinguishes a creative from the rest of the world's population? And that, to me, is the ability to observe. Because in observing, you catalogue in your Rolodex of a brain everything that you've seen. Never sit opposite someone at a lunch without observing them, without studying them. It's yeah. a it's a living um, art class in that hour that you're sitting opposite them. Never sit in a busy city street without crowd watching and seeing the unique differences. Never kick a seed pot in the gutter without picking that seed pot up and studying it for the incredible spaceship design it might be, or the incredible piece of Navi jewelry that it may become. Mm -hmm. Discarded at that point, but not until you've taken a life creative lesson out of that observation. And uh, it's such an obvious one to say, and there may be people that are are watching, rolling their eyes going, yeah, yeah, of course, (laughs) of course, we all know. But it's incredible when you watch people how little they actually observe the world for the unique beauty. Even something that may be entirely um, non-beautiful. It's interesting, this this very room I'm sitting in, there's mm-hmm. a sign that the camera can't see up there for the Noman School, which is a G, but it's made out of rusty steel. And the, the, the person that has asked for that piece of artwork to be made has understood that in a crappy piece of rusty steel that you might see in a shitty bit of uh, um, refuse on the side of the road is beauty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the, uh, advertising hoarding that has had 30 years of paint and posters stuck upon it, which to most would look ugly, actually has a unique beauty and a life lesson of creativity that you need to pop in the roller decks mm-hmm. because of your observation. Yeah. And uh, one of the great blessings of the cell phone is the ability to catalogue it. And um, my, my wife is all constantly telling me to try and get some of my photographs up because I've got over 20,000. You just camera roll is just loaded yeah. with all kinds of stuff. And all, all, my, and all my photographs are, they should be of family and friends, but they're <laughs> of textures, mm-hmm. bits of cracked concrete. They're of uh, unique, uh, the way light may play over a piece of corrugated iron or the beautiful sculpture that adorns the streets mm-hmm. uh, of cities that I get to visit. It's such a, so eloquently put, 
And I don't think there's any better advice than I could ask for in that. I was going to ask you tons of questions about that, but I think that pretty much nails it. Those are words to live by. <laughs> uh, it's, it's wonderful that you still view the world in that way. And I think it is a challenge for artists to continue to try and find ways to push themselves. And it's, it's a, it's, it is a lifetime's pursuit. And that is a great philosophy to follow and keep yourself you know, that is, the, that is the childlike way of looking at the world. And it, oftentimes we lose that. We lose sight of it because of just the constructs that we build around us. And for better or worse, it's, it's the world we live in. But thankfully, there are creative people like you and all these other people that looked to what you do and the way that you guys sort of paved this road. And, and I hope that that continues to grow. And I think that all of these people at the summit and the people attending, as well as all the viewers online, you know, we have a huge amount of international followers that we, LA is a very small bubble of people, but everybody else across the world, they're all looking to, to gain and learn and, and explore these new things. So it's very exciting that you'll be able to, I, I know you have a, a, a speech prepared and when you accept the award, so, I want to give you some time to do that, but I want to thank you for no, coming. No, you're welcome. In. If I can say one last thing, of just course, inspired no, by I don't what want to you rush just you. said. Um, from my perspective, and, and there may be people watching that entirely disagree with what I'm about to say, but from my perspective, figurative sculpture should never be a frozen moment. You're sculpting a static object that's a given mm -hmm. because sculpture doesn't move in its classical sense. But if you sculpt with the intent that you're actually capturing a moment on a journey from A to Z and you just happen to have intervened mm -hmm. at M or K or P mm -hmm. at some point between A and Z and think about the fact that your sculpture is still on a journey from A to Z, it's still got a destination, it's got a starting point, and you happen to have intervened in that sculpture's life in the moment that you chose and captured it in its particular pose, but it isn't a frozen moment. It is, e even a totally static figure maybe sitting asleep is not a frozen moment as such because it has a life, it has a soul, it has a purpose, it had a life before and it has a life afterwards. And if the sculpture can exist in that sort of paradigm, in that sort of way of thinking, something is breathed into the sculpture mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the sculpture lives somehow. I had the great pleasure at the beginning of the year of hanging out with Richard MacDonald and Andrew Corse. And there's two oh, guys yeah. that are uh, living that, that, that view, that their sculptures don't exist just for the frozen moment. They feel like they're on a journey. And uh, I, I think that young artists that are working in ZBrush on the screen and obviously are challenging themselves by the technical uh, uh, conundrums of trying to get better and better at these, at the software, at the interface and so on, must equally be as focused on evaluating the artistic purpose of what they're trying to do. Even if it's a big mech suit that has no human uh, anatomical, anatomical characteristic mm -hmm. exposed on the outside of the mech suit, by the fact that it is still a bipedal, or even if it's a four-legged creature, it still has to speak of organic life and it still has to speak of something that is on a journey from A to Z. And the more that uh, young sculptors that are working in ZBrush can think about that artistic pursuit, the more they'll celebrate in the final outcome, especially when they then push print right. and have it and there it is desk <laughs> for the world to celebrate. That's wonderful so. advice. I, 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 you know, my head's spinning right now. There's just too many, there's too many positive things. I'm very inspired, but hopefully this will inspire all of our listeners and all of these ZBrushers out there that are, they're in these stages and this is something that they will continue to learn, but that's coming from you. That means a lot. Oh, thank you. And, uh, you know, I speak inspired by the, uh, ZBrush artists that we have at work, uh, you know, Greg and Lindsay and Mauro and Gary and all of our sculpting department who have recently got into learning ZBrush, that their willingness to 
uh, take their traditional art skills, and even though they may be in their later, uh, you know, in their senior years of their craft, going, no, no, this is a tool worthy of embracing mm -hmm. and embracing it they have. And the uh, I'll talk about that tonight. In fact, I'll be demonstrating one of the things that we've done with people that only months ago chose to pick up these tools. And that is great acknowledgement of not just their bright-eyed and bushy-tailed enthusiasm, even though they may be in uh, very senior um, practitioners of their craft, mm -hmm. but how the interface of ZBrush can uh, inspire people to try and uh, push a whole new way of thinking and doing. And, uh, you know, the, the fluidity of experience in the technology, uh, in this digital interface, is what is so exciting. And the fact that beautiful art can exist coming out of the screen and the Wacom, the Cintiq, is really, really exciting. Yeah. So. Again, so eloquently put, I can't think of anybody else that deserves the ZBrush Honorary Award more than you. So I think we should let you- Thank you very much. Prep for this. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Richard's gonna go and give a speech here pretty soon. So I'll sign out and I just wanna thank you again. Good, Good thank day. Thank you. Cheers to everyone. This is the ZBrush Podcast. I'll see you guys next time.